Hi, I'm Ken, and this is another Ecology in My Backyard segment. We're going to talk about liquid gold today, and that's maple syrup. And this is one of my favorite things to make. I have a lot of friends that love to make it as well. Um, just the time of year to get out in the woods and spend time and, and see what's happening. But I think it's really interesting to understand the chemical, the physical, and the biological processes that underlie the production of sap. So to start off with, sap is, is largely a function of maples. They're pretty unique in that the xylem tissue, which conducts water from the root system up to the rest of the tree, is surrounded by uh, tissues that have large air bubbles in them. And those air bubbles become really important this time of the year when we're making sap because the uh, freezing temperatures at night, as water expands, it compresses those air bubbles. And that creates a larger passageway in the xylem that allows more water to flow up from the root systems into the tree trunk where we're topping it with this pigot right here. So during the daytime, like today, when it warms up, the sun hits that tree and it causes that water in the ice to melt. And as that melts, um, it releases the pressure where all that compressed gases were inside of that tree. Now they're opening up and creating a pressure. So they're occupying more space and that reduces the volume of the xylem tissue and causes a hydrostatic pressure inside of the tree. And that sap has nowhere to go. The buds on the ends of the leaves where the leaves normally would be, there's no pressure for, um, there's no schemata on those leaves to allow that, that pressure to leave. And so when those buds are at the end of the leaves where they are right now, the only place that sap can go is out through the spigot. And so we're catching it in these buckets. And you know, on a good day, we get half a bucket worth of sap on this one tree. That sap tastes slightly sweet, but it doesn't taste syrupy like the maple syrup you put on the pancakes. That happens when we take about 40 volumes of this sap and bring it down to one volume of sugar, of maple syrup. So right now the sugar content in the sap is about two and a half percent. We'll bring that to 66%. And that's what by law, maple syrup has to have in it. So why 66% sugar? If we have less than 66% 66% sugar content, it's subject to microbial activity and your sap, your syrup can go bad if it ferments. If you have more than 66% sugar in your maple syrup, your maple syrup will start to crystallize. It's super saturated. And so 67% sugar content is exactly what we want. So the sap coming out today, we're getting towards the end of the season. And the sap has um, sugars in it. And those sugars change throughout the season. So at the start of the season, it's sucrose. And sucrose is stored throughout the year from last winter. Uh, and it came from the leaves that were photosynthesizing last summer. And if you remember photosynthesis, it's taking inorganic carbon in the form of carbon dioxide in the presence of photosynthetically active pigments like chlorophyll, capturing that energy and using it to fix the inorganic carbon into an organic carbon compound like glucose. That glucose is important for the tree, not for us, not for us to benefit from it, but the tree uses it itself. And one reason it uses that, those sugars are for uh, filling in wounds. So the spigot on the tree, when I pull that out in, in past years, those wounds have healed right up and that's important. The tree also uses those glucose monomers for building this trunk. So the trunk is made out of cellulose, which is a polymer of glucose. All those individual glucose is lined up together in uh, beta glycosidic links. They're joined together one after the other in beta links, which we can't eat ourselves, uh, but we can use the sugar monomers and alpha glycosidic links, and they're the ones that we put into the sugar. So. The, uh, the tree itself will use all those beta glycosidic links to make cellulose, which is stored energy in the tree trunk. We can burn that in the winter months, release that energy fixed by the sun in the previous years, and use that to release heat to warm our house. But in this case, we're after the syrup. And so um, we're going to take the, uh, the starch that was stored in the roots. And as it comes up, it's going to be released as sucrose. That sucrose, as the season progresses, will break down more and more into fructose and glucose. Fructose and glucose are more subject to um, uh, microbial degradation as well as Maillard reactions. So the sucrose is changed by microbial conversion within the tree. The longer the season, the more the microbial activity because it's warming up and the more glucose and fructose we have. And that makes the sap coming out of the tree um, more subject to caramelization. And caramelization is when you roast a marshmallow over open fire, that white marshmallow becomes caramelized. It gets that thick coating on it. The same thing happens when we boil the sap. So the sap towards the end of the year is more caramelized and it also goes through some Maillard reactions. And Maillard reactions are when amino acids also found within the sap react under high temperatures and make darker colored pigments. So it's a very complex 
pathway. There's thousands of reactions that happen when you boil sap to make maple syrup. Um, and so what some processors do is they can't get away from the boiling reactions, but what they do do is use reverse osmosis to pre-concentrate much of that sap and increase the sugar content before they go to the boiling process. Now you can't get rid of the boiling process because that gives the unique flavor through the caramelization and Maillard reactions, but you can reduce the amount of time you have to be boiling it if you pre constate with reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis is simply taking that sap and driving it under a high pressure through a semi-permeable membrane. And that semi-permeable membrane is designed such that it only lets pure water molecules pass through it. The sugar molecules will stay on the pressurized side of the semi-permeable membrane, while the, the filtrate that passes through that semi-permeable membrane could just be discharged onto the ground. So they'll take it from about 1.5% to 2.5% to sugar content when it comes out of the tree to about 8% sugar content. And then they still have to boil it in evaporators in order to get those processes they want. So the sugar that comes out at the start of the year has more sucrose. Uh, it ends up making a lighter colored syrup, which has a lighter flavor to it, not as strong. And that tends to be the most desirable. It used to be called grade A. Now it's just called light fancy or something equivalent to that. The darker syrup towards the end of the year, we're getting into that now, has more of the fructose and glucose monomers in it. And they're more subject to the Maillard reactions as well as caramelization. And that ends up producing a darker syrup when you boil it. And so there's a lot of complex uh, chemistry, again, about a thousand different reactions. We've been making maple syrup on this continent for about two centuries, First Nations before that. We're only now starting to understand some of those very complex chemical reactions um, that are happening within this, this syrup. Okay, so uh, the, the government regulates your sugar content and the marketing boards regulate how you can sell it based by color. So it's a very complex, very organized uh, system, but at the end of the day, it tastes great on your pancakes. So a little bit more about ecology in our backyard. We'll just end with a, a little shot here of the sap coming out of the tree. You can see that hydrostatic pressure forcing it out through the sigma, uh, through the spigot from the xylem cells. And that's just that water warming up that was frozen last night. The air bubbles are creating more pressure on there. The water itself um, is can't expand, that's hydraulics, but the, the pneumatics inside of the, those gases are forcing that sap out through this release port in the spigot, and we're collecting it in this bucket. We'll boil this down, we'll filter it, boil it down, and uh, again, it takes about 40 parts sap to make about one part maple syrup.